This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. I'd like to welcome all of you and express my gratitude to you for coming here. My name is Jack Citrin. I'm the director of the Institute of Governmental Studies at Berkeley, which is sponsoring this event with the assistance of a number of other organizations whom I will thank in a minute. I think the topic, fiscal crisis in California, is both timely and, I think, unquestioned. Uh, a number of cities, as we know, have declared bankruptcy this year, and the state is itself struggling with uh, what to do as, it, uh, as this important election actually approaches. Uh, so we're going to hear today from a diverse group of people who are <coughs> truly expert on these matters and experienced. They come from different backgrounds and have, I think, different perspectives. Uh, while I think people may disagree about the severity of the crisis, about the causes of the crisis, and about the solutions, I don't think anyone disagrees that uh, an engaged discussion and analysis is really very important at this moment. And so we are going to try and provide that kind of discussion today, hopefully with uh, a lot of input from people in the audience after the panelists have spoken. Uh, before I begin, I need to thank the sponsors of this program. First of all, Bill Brandt, John Phelan, and Steve Victor of DSI and DSI Civic. They've been instrumental in both supporting the organization, helping <coughs> organize it, and indeed it was Bill Brandt who suggested that this would be an important project for IGS and he is correct. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Bill Banneke of Deutsche Bank and Tom Lockhart of Stone and Youngberg for their... <laughs> Guess where Tom is? <laughs> uh, for their financial support and for their participation as well. And there have been partners in helping to promote the conference, bring you here, ABAG, Bay Area Council, California State Association of Counties, and San Francisco Planning and Urban Research Association. Finally, it's important for me to thank the staff at IGS who have made this conference possible. Terry Bimes, who's essentially the chair of this conference, along with Max Neiman, they have organized it and worked hard on all aspects of the program and the, uh, the way in which we're going to conduct business. Uh, also, uh, Mark Levin and Ethan Rarick of IGS have participated in this process. I'd really like to have special thanks to Liz Markson, who you'll see running around, and she's been responsible for having seats, for having food, for having mics, for having everything. And so, Liz, thank you very much for your help. So those end my preliminary remarks. I want to just repeat a, a warm welcome to you all. And I'm going to turn over the program now to my colleague, Max <coughs> Neiman, who's chairing the first panel entitled An Overview of California's Fiscal Crisis. How bad is it? Um, thank you very much. And thank you again for all of the support that we've gotten, and um, both internally and from outside, and for all the attendees. I'm uh, going to try to keep things as short as possible regarding the preliminary introductions because we want to keep as much time available as possible for presentations and Q&A. Um, but uh, I also want to emphasize how fortunate uh, I am and I think we all are for 
the group that's up here. Uh, this is a really uh, accomplished and committed and engaged group of individuals whose careers uh, have been devoted, I think, to good solid policy analysis as well as uh, serving the public good. Um, and I know all of them from their work and some of them personally and uh, I'm really delighted to have them here. So we're going to start off with Scott Patterson, who served as a executive, who has served, who has served, and dropped off, uh, as the executive director of the National Association of State Budget Officers in Washington, D.C. since 2001. And prior to that, he spent four years as Virginia's state budget director and also headed the regulatory and economic analysis section of the Virginia Department of Planning and Budget. He's served in various capacities in the office of the Virginia Attorney General, including as counsel on finance issues, and began his career as an attorney with the federal government in several positions at the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Uh, we'll then uh, move over to Tracy Gordon, who I was fortunate enough to work with in earlier part of her career at PPIC. Uh, she's currently a fellow in the Economic Studies um, Division at Brookings Institution. She's an expert on state and local public finances, uh, has done a considerable amount of work on California as well. Uh, previous experience includes uh, being a, uh, on the faculty at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Um, She's a research fellow at the, was a research fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California. Uh, she's a graduate of the uh, Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, she will be the second speaker. Uh, she'll be followed by Michael Coleman, who is a principal fiscal policy advisor, both to the California Society of Municipal Finance Officers and for over 15 years to the League of California Cities. And I have to tell you, um, we may not always agree with what Michael is saying, but he's the only one, I'm convinced, who understands uh, fiscal relations in California. Um, and if you need an explanation, he's the one to go to. Uh, and he's very generous with his time. Um, he's an expert on California local government revenue, spending, and financing. He's a creator of California Local Government Finance Almanac. He has a fabulous um, a website called CaliforniaCityFinance.com, which has been enormously valuable to me, both as a researcher and as a professor. And Coleman is also the author of numerous articles and references, including the California Municipal Review Sources Handbook. Um, he's an experienced city fiscal officer and has previously worked for the cities of San Mateo, Milpitas, Daly City and he um, is a product of UC Davis. And finally, we have Peter Detweiler, um, who has a long distinguished career at the state legislature and was the staff director for the Senate F Governance and Finance Committee, studied public policy and administration at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, and government at St. Mary's College. And for, and for nearly 30 years, Detweiler analyzed state and local public services related to land use, public finance, and government topics. Um, so I think we're really quite fortunate to have this group, and we're going to start without any further delay um, with Scott. Well, good morning. I, I really appreciate being able to come here from Washington, D.C., mostly because the humidity is so much less. <laughs> but I also have to say, I really do love coming to California. And what I get a kick out of is I spent a lot of time in Sacramento meeting with the various financial management officials and, of course, the Department of Finance people. And I tell them, I just love coming out here. You have such intellectually challenging fiscal issues. And, and they always say, well, that's not quite how I would put it. But <laughs> anyway, let me go over a few things to give you a broad overview of what we're seeing. And some of these slides I won't go into a lot of detail. But if you have questions, I'm here all day. And, and of course, the data is on our website. The bottom line is that the good news is we're going up. What we're seeing not only in California, pretty much every other state, is a continued improvement of the aggregate revenues and expenditures. But there are many challenges ahead. You all know what they are. I don't have to go through all of them, whether it's pension liability long term or structural issues. They're, they're seen in other states, but they seem a little more pronounced here in California. Summer, summer revenue was not great, which is interesting. A lot of states were below forecast, 
you all, as you know, were below forecast in July and made up for it with an above forecast revenue in August. Although first quarter fiscal year, it doesn't give you a lot to go on. So I, I don't read a lot in the fact that summer revenue was slow. But we're still seeing a lot of states that aren't back to where they were pre-recession. And that's the measure for us as state budget officers. When do you get back to where you were before? Now, California and the other states all have the same challenges, basically the tighter resources with health care and other items. And of course, you're asking yourselves these questions, and other states are too. Do you have enough for Medicaid, K through 12, all the things that the states have to have revenue <coughs> at for in their budget? There's a big question across this country if there's enough for infrastructure. And of course, we all know the issues with the gas tax not providing sufficient funds, either at the federal or state level, for future infrastructure needs. The other thing, and I can't emphasize this enough, regardless of who is in office, I think we can safely predict that over time, federal spending will decline, both directly for states, but indirectly for a lot of things that states care about. It may really hurt some states, whether it's labs, whether it's uh, defense contracting, and whether it's bases and things like that. I think we can plan on that. I think it's going to be a little more incremental and not as dramatic as some have, have predicted. So let me just mention something about the new normal that we're seeing so far in state budget growth. The bottom line is the average, which is this red line, is 5.6% year over year budget growth. That's not. Uh, adjusted for inflation. If you adjust it for inflation, it's a little closer to, to just under 3%. But the bottom line here, what I want to emphasize, is so far during this recovery, year-over-year -year budget growth has been below average. And most budget officers are anticipating that will continue for at least another couple of fiscal years, if not beyond. That's the concern that we have to adjust to the new normal of slower-than-average growth, unless kind of in the mid-teens, fiscal year 15 plus, we get another boom, which I'm hoping will come out of California with some new wonderful IT innovations not far. A lot of strategies being used across the country. I won't go over all of these, but we've seen reduction in local aid, layoffs, furloughs, use of rainy day funds, and so forth. And let me go over some spending trends, which I think will give you a really good overview. If you look at total state expenditures, this is based on every dime states have coming in, whether it's from the federal government, gas tax, income tax, and so forth, you'll see that Medicaid continues to grow. It used to be a lot less than K through 12 a few years ago. It's 23.6% versus K through 12, 20%. K through 12 was always number one, but no longer in total state expenditures. Interestingly, if you look at California, Medicaid is more than that as far as total state expenditures and K through 12 a little bit less than average. And I'll go back to the total. As you can see, 10% of total state expenditures for the 50 states average is for higher education. It's about 7.5% in California. Now, if you look at own source funds based on your income taxes and sales taxes, things coming just in for the state, you'll see that Medicaid and education is a huge majority of the spending. It's 35% for K through 12, about 17.5% for Medicaid, and higher ed about 11.5%. I don't think people will be surprised that higher ed percentage has really been shrinking over the last 10 years quite significantly. If you look at California, it's quite interesting that K through 12 is about the same, higher ed about the same, but actually California as a percentage of their own state funds spends less on Medicaid. Here's what's interesting, though. You spend a lot more on corrections. Probably no surprise to this audience. It's 10.3%. I'll go back to that other general fund side slide, about 7.5% for other states. Now, what's driving the general fund percentage growth? In every state I go into except California, it's Medicaid. And Medicaid is very important here, too. But when I go to the California slide, it's corrections. And you are unique that way. And, and I find it very interesting because just about every other state, pretty much 49 other states, it's all Medicaid all the time. I went into, I was in St. Paul in Minnesota, and, and I said, what's your biggest challenge? And the Minnesota budget director says, we have a company called 3M here. It's Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicaid. <laughs> 
But I, I wanted to show you this because it really shows the structural issues that California has are, are a little more compounded than other states that has to be dealt with. Now, just to finish up, a few more comments about state spending from federal funds. Medicaid is a huge portion. And I predict it's just under 50%. It's about 43.5% now. I predict in three years, Medicaid is going to be well over 50% because you're going to get more federal funds for Medicaid. And secondly, all kinds of other grant programs and monies from the feds are going to start to shrink. And you're going to really see most of the state relationship with the federal government is going to be over health care and Medicaid. And, and that's kind of the trend and direction. If you look at California, I, I find this interesting. It's a higher percentage. I, I mean, it's a higher percentage for other states. It's 40% for California. And if I go back, it's about 43.5% for the other states. I think that indicates, and I, I think folks know this, there are a lot of people on Medicaid, but uh, California is not necessarily, in terms of benefits, as generous as other states. So that explains why some of the data is falling this way. Now, I won't go over all of these. I, I think it's quite interesting that the other states are doing all kinds of things. And it's important, I think, to look at those lessons. And what's interesting to me is I often, one of the reasons I do get to come to Sacramento once or twice a year is to talk about what other states are doing. Now, I have to say not everybody listens. But uh, I do like to come and talk about the different things that are going on in other states, because I think we can all learn from each other. One of them is prudent use of debt, but the other is, and, and I, I should mention something about that, because a lot of people don't realize this. Outside of California and about two or three other states, no other state ever, ever borrows for operating costs. The only debt in other states is for capital, and, and a lot of people aren't aware of that. The other thing is, that there, there are certainly things like liabilities. But I, I find that very interesting. But the other thing is, other states, and I have rainy day funds and one time only here, they really are developing processes to try to figure out when revenue is above average and capture that so it doesn't get in the base. And that's something I think California has to really figure out how to do, partly because you do have a much more volatile economy. In some ways, that's good, because you're more like a, a big country. Uh, than a small state like North Dakota, but, but you really need to figure out how do we have processes and create the right incentives to make sure we capture that one-time only funding. The other thing, there's another one here that I think is an important bullet, and that is avoid bad practices in good times. Most states, when times are really good, they put a lot of money in the pension system, they, put, they use cash for capital, they do things like that to keep their base from getting too high. And I would really emphasize if there are ways to create the right incentives, and I realize there are a lot of challenges politically and structurally in California to do this, but if there are the right incentives to try to avoid bad practices in good times, that's another thing that will be good from a structural standpoint. So let me finish up with the outlook that we see from a national perspective when we look at the data for all the states. The trends are positive. We're going in the right direction. Things are going up. But as I mentioned, the new normal so far for states is below average growth, and most of them are expecting that to be the case for quite a while. And a lot of states aren't even back to pre-recession. But as I mentioned from that lessons learned side, there are a lot of opportunities. And it's overused as a term, but an opportunity does exist when times are bad or not as good. So they shouldn't be wasted. But of course, you know more than I do the challenges California faces, spending pressures are going to continue. There will not be enough resources for all the things that Californians want to see done from their government. And federal funds are going to decline. And again, I think it's going to be more incremental than dramatic, but it's still going to happen. And I think the state has to kind of brace itself for that. So anyway, uh, nasbo.org, we have all the data there. You can compare California with any other state. And again, I appreciate being with you today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. It's, um, often this is seen as a depressing subject, but I hope that I can make it a little bit more interesting and exciting. So um, this 
picture is of Laurel and Hardy, and you probably remember the constant refrain of another fine mess you've gotten me into. And I guess what I'm trying to get at with this presentation is how do we, and I, I still identify as a Californian, how do we keep getting in this mess? Okay, so this is sort of scenes from a California budget, like scenes from a marriage, the Bergman movie. Uh, you can see that there's often a lot of anguish involved in California budgeting. Really, you could pick your year, 2008, 2009, 2011. This year was unusual in that California actually got pretty close to its constitutional deadline for passing a new budget. Um, but September 2008, for example, the budget was passed a record 85 days into the new fiscal year, 100 days late. Um, that record was soon superseded. Um, but you could almost picture every, every summer there's, there's uh, you recognize Sproul Plaza, um, protests over cuts to education, threatened IOUs, furloughs of state employees. Um, it's very frustrating. So the current state of play, the fiscal year 2013 budget was passed, um, assuming new revenues uh, that are coming from uh, an initiative that's on the ballot in November. Um, that's about $8.5 billion. If that initiative fails, then certain trigger guts will go into effect, about $6 billion that would predominantly affect K-14 to education, that's K-12 to schools, plus uh, community colleges, as well as higher education. And all these areas have been cut already over the last couple of years. So these are severe, real cuts. Um, but what's interesting to me is that, as uh, someone who's been outside of the state for a little while and getting a chance to dig back into this, even if Prop 30 passes, the state is still projected to end fiscal year 13 with a $3.6 billion deficit. And that's basically because revenues have not been keeping up with expectations. So why does this keep happening? Um, I've been maintaining this chart for a couple of years since I was at PPIC. This is the projected size of the problem at the beginning of each budget cycle. This is money coming in versus money going out. So it doesn't take account of things like uh, carry-in balances from the previous year or carry-in deficits, for that matter, from the previous year, which we already have one from fiscal year 2012. That's part of the contributor of this problem going forward. Um, but if we just look at inflows and outflows, our operating um, deficits, as uh, Scott alluded to, California has had a, I hate to say, structural deficit, because that's sort of a loaded term. It means an ongoing gap between revenues and expenditure, regardless of where the state is in the economic cycle. But I think it's indisputable that we do have one of these in California, given that this has been a problem since fiscal year 2003. So the question that I have when I look at this graph is, why didn't we fix the roof when it wasn't raining? Um, now, actually, the roof has been repaired, I guess is a good way to put it. This graph used to be a lot worse. It was continuing straight down. You can see there's this nice W shape now and some improvement, and that's because of, to be fair, tough choices that the legislature and the governor have made, real ongoing spending cuts to things like cash assistance, services for the disabled, higher education, Medicaid. Um, so those have a lasting effect. What used to be double-digit uh, gaps between revenues and expenditures are now in the eight to nine billion dollar and even the five billion dollar range in the out years. Um, but there are risks to this assessment, which we can talk about later. So why does this keep happening? The usual suspects are, well, it's the economy, um, it's the tax system, it's expenditures on autopilot, it's the process, it's the politics. And so I'll go through all of these in turn. Um, the economy certainly helps. So these are graphs which I basically took from a presentation that the finance director, Mike Genest, gave on New Year's Eve of 2008. And the important thing about these graphs is I know that the response is kind of small. These are all economic indicators, and it's the difference between projections when the budget was passed in 2008, September 23rd, like I said, the fiscal year starts on July 1st. Um, the assumptions in that budget are the red lines, everything was going up, what actually happened, which became clear in November of 2008, was that everything was going down, and those are the green lines. So basically, the state suddenly had a $40 billion problem that it had to solve, and that's why the governor's budget was released on New Year's Eve of 2008 in a dreary hotel room by the finance director instead of under the Capitol Dome by the governor during the, the pomp and circumstance and pageantry of the uh, State of the State speech. So that was a dismal year, and so certainly California is subject to the vagaries of the economic cycle. Um, California also has a volatile revenue system. So uh, this shows changes in GDP or, uh, sorry, personal income versus uh, general fund revenues. And you can see that revenues are very responsive to changes in the economy. Um, now, that's a feature, not a bug. That's part of the design of the, econ of the income tax system in California. California relies more on income taxes than other states do. So as Scott pointed out, 
Um, basically, if you mess with the bull, you get the horns. If you benefit from getting a lot of revenue during the good years, that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you can sock that money away and have it available for later. So California hasn't traditionally done that. That's a budgeting issue, not a revenue issue. Um, but another policy choice that California has made, which is a re revenue issue, is to tax these volatile sources of income more heavily. So in general, the world is changing. Incomes are growing more divergent. You probably all saw the new data on income inequality. Income inequality is growing at the state level in California as in other states. And people at the top tend to earn more of their income from volatile sources like capital gains and stock options. So if anyone's heard of Facebook, uh, the state was counting on a big revenue bump from Facebook, and that hasn't necessarily materialized. So pity the poor revenue estimator who's trying to figure out how much money is coming in based on these little snippets of data and highly uncertain sources of income. It's not just your standard uh, you know, monthly wage anymore. Um, but California kind of puts its, all of its eggs in one basket by taxing those sources of income more heavily than other states do. So its, its rate on capital gains taxes is higher than other states, and that's a policy choice. Although, as Scott pointed out, you could also use those additional revenues to cushion the downturns. So what about the expenditure side? In Governor Schwarzenegger's fiscal year 2008 budget, he said that more than 90% of spending was on autopilot, that there was nothing that he could do about it. Um, and that's because of federal mandates. So if you want to get, as the Supreme Court made very clear this summer, if you want to get matching funds for Medicaid, you have to spend on certain mandatory populations and certain mandatory programs. Now, having said that, on average, states spend something like, uh, or something like 70% of total state expenditures on Medicaid are for optional populations and optional programs. Um, and California, you know, certainly has availed itself of those opportunities. But as Scott was pointing out, California benefits from having a relatively young and healthy population and cutting Medicaid uh, provider payments. So in some ways, it gets off cheap. So, but there are certain rules like that around Medicaid and other types of programs. And then California has its own share of constitutional protections for certain types of spending and also uh, voter initiatives. But one thing that kind of makes you kind of suspect of this figure is that there are a lot of figures that are tossed around and they always have this kind of false precision like 63% of expenditures are off limits. No, no, it's 78% of expenditures that are off limits. How do we really know? That's something that I think requires a lot more attention. And what does it mean to be off limits? Um, so, uh, so to be fair, um, Californians do really like to do ballot box, ballot box budgeting. Um, the Legislative Analyst Office tracks initiatives that have to do with spending and taxes, and I realize that you can't read this, but just trust me, there are a lot of them. <laughs> so the key issue uh, that researchers always love to ask is, well, what is the counterfactual? What would have happened in the absence of the initiative process? And John Matsusaka kind of said about doing this back in 2004, and he said, look, how much of the budget is really constrained by spending initiatives, really there's one smoking gun, and that's Prop 98, which has basically mandated that the state spend a certain proportion of its income on education. And so you could say, well, maximum maybe 32% of spending is constrained by initiatives, and that's one big initiative, which is Prop 98. And our local government experts on the panel can get into how this actually has been and often is uh, overridden by the legislature. Now, the state has to settle up uh, with school districts later if it does that. Um, but there's also a question of whether Prop 98 provides a ceiling or a floor on education spending and whether the legislature really would have spent less on kids in the absence of this initiative measure. Um, honestly, if you talk to people who put together budgets in Sacramento, they'll tell you that the initiative process makes things more difficult for them. It certainly is trickier to kind of figure out how to craft a budget, but it's not impossible. Um, but I think a bigger issue, political scientists often refer to the initiative process as the gun behind the door. It's the threat that the initiative, um, will, go, that initiative will go forward, and perhaps that constrains legislators from taking um, tough actions. Also, I think it's worth pointing out that most states that have the initiative are west of the Mississippi. Um, there are states that do not have the initiative process, and they have budget problems too. Um, so those would be states like New Jersey and New York, and uh, actually New York does have the initiative, but plenty of states have budget problems and not all of them have direct democracy. Um, but California has its share of other institutional quirks. There's a two-thirds requirement for all new tax increases thanks to Prop 13. Um, there used to be a two-thirds requirement for passing a budget, but that's been changed through the initiative process. Um, there's a term limited legislature, and some people argue that that leads to sort of uh, less quality legislation. Um, until recently, we had a problem with sort of gerrymandered legislative districts that's being addressed by the Citizens Redistricting Commission. And in general, we have polarized politics in this state. 
Um, I was struck by um, actually one of the votes that led to the open primary um, where some Republicans crossed party lines, there was a campaign in Orange County, a talk radio station that had a campaign called Heads on a Stick, where they showed members of the legislature impaled and basically started a recall effort against those that had uh, joined into this uh, bipartisan agreement. So it's a really difficult political environment for people to work across party lines in California. Um, and as our other speakers will talk about, we have a dysfunctional state and local relationship and this, again, I, I don't expect you to be able to see this, but this is an LAO uh, drawing of how that relationship has evolved. And it basically started with Prop 13 when the state basically bailed out local governments who lost about half of their property tax revenue in one fell swoop, but then took back that money in the early 90s when they had their own budget problems at the state level. And there's been this ongoing, you took my money, no we didn't, yes we did kind of thing going on. Um, that's a gross simplification. Okay. Um, but I, I do want to say there's some good news, which is that California is a wealthy state. California has a high fiscal capacity compared to other states. This is just using a measure that the Treasury Department uh, in Washington puts together called total taxable resources. And the good news is you've got a lot of them. Um, so what does this all mean? Well, budgeting is all about trade-offs and tough choices. And California has had some, some good luck um, in terms of the economic boom of the 1990s and then again in the 2000s, and it's had some bad luck. Um, closing the defense industry back in the early 1990s and being struck by the housing bust um, more recently, but it's also made some good and bad policy choices. Um, those choices can be undone. And so I think one good thing um, about the crisis, as, as Scott was mentioning as well, is that people are more attuned to budgeting in California, and that's really key. And so this is an opening to have a frank conversation about what kind of state Californians want and what they're willing to pay for. So thank you very much. Well, I'm going to drill this down a little bit and talk about the fiscal conditions of cities, since that's my particular bailiwick. But it's, of course, impossible to completely separate from the state of California, although some of us would like to, perhaps. Um, uh, but uh, the first uh, notion, it's been said, the economy is recovering. California uh, was uh, hit especially hard. It's also leading the recovery. So that's the good news. And when, as that translates to local budgets, uh, what we're seeing is an uptick in taxable sales. Uh, widespread, but there's some variance by region, but taxable sales are coming back. We're seeing that already. That's fairly responsive to the economy. Property tax growth is flat. There's a lag in the property tax. There's a lag in assessed valuations, how we see that recovery happening, how that shows up and then in the tax rolls, how that shows up in local budgets. That's still to come in many communities. Uh, many uh, agencies have used some short-term band-aids, perhaps ill-advisedly, not following my advice, not recognizing that this is not a short-term situation, uh, but those short-term band-aids, if they were there, are generally gone. There uh, is a lingering problem with the pensions. Uh, there's going to be more discussion about that today. Uh, the redevelopment disillusion, no matter how you feel about that, whether you think redevelopment as it was a, a good or a bad thing, could not have come at a worse time financially for local governments. Um, lots of difficulty in managing that financially, lots of extra workload. Um, there is fear and loathing <laughs> in the staff, um, uh, concern about additional state actions, even though it seems to us that everything that could go has gone, including redevelopment, which many of us never thought would actually uh, be uh, killed off, but that was sort of a tragic Greek story there. Um, and and uh, staff and councils are overwhelmed by many of the situations. This is sort of the widespread situation, and, and there is continuing uh, situation, uh, I, I think, a, 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 a state of denial out there among many uh, folks uh, that I believe uh, needs to be corrected because uh, we can't uh, face this uh, w with uh, that state of denial. Now, having said that, I want to preface, uh, as I, before I get into the meat of this, this is still, I'm still in the preface part, um, that, that, uh, that city revenues are not directly related to the economic uh, re recovery. So, so they, they don't move exactly in tandem. There is some relationship, but that's why we see a delay. We see more recovery in the state revenues right now because of the nature of the state revenues than we do in local revenue portfolios, primarily because the property tax is lagging. 
Uh, and there's a lot of variance among local agencies, not just in their local economies and the kind of revenue portfolios and the kind of priority choices they make about spending, but in their very structure of governance. Some cities do not have responsibility for paying for fire service. That's a huge part of city budgets in many full service cities. It's not even there in many other cities. That just changes the nature of the game and it makes things hard to compare city across city. And of course there are many other variations, so it's difficult to make generalizations. And then as we start to talk about fiscal conditions, I would right off the bat take off the table these uh, situations that are really caused by legal cat catastrophe, by a policy decision that was challenged in court, usually regarding a land use decision that, that puts the city into a fiscal catastrophe. That really has nothing to do with the fiscal condition. Um, Half Moon Bay, you'll see lifted on, listed on there, did not go into bankruptcy because they managed to negotiate their way out of an adverse fiscal judgment. So uh, many, of these, many times these can be worked out. Um, Likewise, the uh, issues of corruption and things like that that we see in Bell and in other communities uh, really uh, <laughs> cross history and aren't, aren't tied to, uh, to, to the fiscal downturn, although sometimes the fiscal uh, struggles help to reveal those situations. So we really have left this Vallejo, Stockton, and San Bernardino type crisis as our key examples at this point. And um, what I want to talk about is, is at this point is, is, is how we got into these particular outlying situations. And the first thing I'm going to say that is in addition to uh, the underlying uh, revenue and fiscal struggles, these uh, issues and the situations that these cities have found themselves in are largely driven by policy choices. That's not just external forces, but it's by decisions, uh, not by management in terms of managing the situation, but by, by policy makers. Uh, well-intentioned many times to want to be generous with their employees and want to uh, make sure that their employee workforce is well compensated or to be aggressive with economic development strategies uh, to try to bet on the future or perhaps too risky uh, ways. Uh, those are some examples. So let's talk about some of these pitfalls. We can, we can look at, first I want to say before I get into the pitfalls and the troubled cities, certain factors widespread throughout California that are, have caused fiscal stress among cities. Certainly ongoing fiscal state takeaways, the fallout from this trouble that the state budget has had and the fallout from that on local budgets. Certainly the downturn in the economy. Uh, certainly widespread issues of, of uh, over generous compensation packages uh, because of the PERD system. So many local agencies are in the PERD system in California and that, is, that drives uh, the, the larger, uh, perhaps overly generous uh, compensation packages. But uh, there are certain uh, communities where the, the combination, the multiple factors of these are particularly severe. Um, and so the particularly uh, 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 unsustainable core revenues in, in certain areas in California, in the Central Valley, as we know, that ha bore the brunt of the downturn in the housing market, uh, certain areas uh, that have, that have leveraged those, uh, those downturns, uh, trying to bet on future economic development downturns and then got caught in the downturn especially hard. Uh, some uh, cities over relying on land use development in the future that has not that turned around that was one of the Vallejo's uh, contributing factors for example an over reliance on redevelopment agencies uh, revenues um, that that is that now cities are struggling if they were were heavily in, that was a large part of their workforce that was a lot of what they were into because say they were a contract city and what they really did mostly was redevelopment the rest of the stuff was contracted out huge impact on the city workforce and they're working their way out of this um, risky financing schemes then this whole area of compensation on the spending side, unsustainable and intractable employee compensation levels, especially in public employee uh, pension and health care. We're going to talk more about that today in other panels. And in, a, in the more severe cases, going so far as to cede management decisions into the charter and into law to uh, the employee labor group. So that the city, for example, in Vallejo's case and in Stockton's case, found itself in a situation where it could not even reduce uh, employees, could not even restructure or reduce staffing levels, let alone compensation, that that management right had been taken away from it because it gave it away into charter amendments. In both of those cities, part of the workout has been to delete those, uh, those elements uh, f from their charters. Most cities will be able to manage their way out of this. Uh, the ones that are particularly problem areas that have this uh, nasty recipe, particularly nasty recipe, you then whittle down among those, many of those will manage their way out of it. But it depends upon having management staff, elected leaders, and stakeholders, the key elements of those people that have a sense of courage in being able to approach the problem in a timely way, to take on things more, uh, that are difficult, to collaborate with each other, a sense of trust, and a, and a competency. Those things all go together. And in the communities where we've seen the particular problems, this is a problem. 
We have toxic politics in San Bernardino. It's no secret, so I can say that clearly in here, and even say I'm a, uh, I work for the League of California Cities and not worry about my job. Um, there, there were uh, problems in Vallejo and getting uh, the employee groups, and, and also some problems in Stockton, at least with one remaining group at least, of getting them to sort of face up and get out of the role of denial and realize that, comp uh, that, that changes need to be made, that there needs to be collaboration. Um, cities that are not able to achieve this uh, climate of collaboration, of courage, of managing it through, instead uh, end up with toxic relations denial, and they start to go over this tipping point of borrowing and doing the kinds of things that we have seen the state of California get into difficulty with, borrowing for operating costs from their own special funds. You start to dig a hole there, you start to go over the cliff, uh, and then it becomes very difficult to dig out. Now, most cities, I think, will be able to manage their way out of this. And the difficult th thing about this, for those that are observing in the credit markets, um, is that this is not something you can measure. It's very difficult to measure who's got you know, quality leadership and management and who's going to be able to make those management decisions and manage to foster a climate of trust to be get everybody to collaborate and make those decisions that are necessary before you start going over the cliff and doing things that, that drive you uh, past the tipping point. So, so uh, th this, is, this is, I think, what we, we, we are facing. Uh, it's particularly important, I think, as we go through this, not to uh, do the lazy thing, to make widespread generalizations that somehow uh, the credit of all cities is implicated in this. These are particular agencies that are in particular difficult situations and then have the, the, the inability to manage their way out of it. So uh, you have to look uh, surgically at the individual agencies that are, that are facing these kinds of difficulties. Um, and I look forward to the discussions of the rest of the panels on this today. Who's next? And I think um, you know, those of you who have uh, withdrawal problems in the absence of PowerPoint, prepare yourself. We're going to be relieved of the PowerPoint. For I'm a talking head. That's right. <laughs> Look, it didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this way. Redevelopment in California recently ended in a complete cluster of misunderstandings, recriminations, and broken promises. Sixty years after California voters amended our Constitution to allow property tax increment financing, TIF, redevelopment agencies went out of business on February the 1st, 2012. For your numerologist, yes, that was 2112. <laughs> if only the Mayans knew. How? How could such a lucrative and often successful public private partnership fail after six decades? Scores of downtown office towers exist now because of redevelopment. Hundreds of new public buildings, tens of thousands, literally not figuratively, tens of thousands of affordable housing units and millions of square feet of commercial and industrial space exist because of what redevelopment agencies did and what they financed. In short, redevelopment changed the way that California looks, and mostly for the better. The 425 former California redevel community redevelopment agencies were nearly ubiquitous. Every big city, every city over 250,000 had a redevelopment agency. Over 80% of all cities had redevelopment agencies, and so did 31 out of our 58 counties. So added together, if you were to take that 425 former redevelopment agencies, add them together, look at their total annual expenditures, treat them as a, as, as a one big government, that would rival state spending by the state of Maine or the state of Delaware maybe they should have become members of your organization. CRAs, or community redevelopment agencies, combined annual revenues would have placed them in the Fortune 500 alongside Huntsman Chemicals and right between Starbucks and Harris Entertainment. So how did we get here? Let's remember that the state always had twin interests in wanting redevelopment agencies to succeed. We wanted to get rid of blight. That's our substantive, long-term commitment to redevelopment. Leave no neighborhood behind. The costs of dealing with social pathologies that arise because of physical and economic blight are higher than 
getting rid of blight. And so we wanted to take care of those neighborhoods, those downtowns. Secondly was the fiscal reason. And as I'll show you in just a moment, there was a growing indirect state general fund subsidy to redevelopment. We were paying for it, and so we cared. To get rid of blight, to eradicate this blight, the state had given redevelopment agencies three extraordinary powers, literally extraordinary, beyond the usual that the underlying cities or the underlying county governments didn't get. First of all, they could directly spend public money to subsidize private investment. That gets around the whole gift of public funds constitutional prohibition that applies to cities and counties and special districts in California. That's a big asset for redevelopment. Secondly, by declaring that the purpose of redevelopment was to eradicate blight, redevelopment agencies could use their eminent domain powers in ways that their underlying cities and counties couldn't. Highly controversial, but entirely constitutional. And finally, the property tax increment financing. Because as it emerged, property tax increment financing was largely subsidized by other local governments and by the state general fund through the Serrano backfill. Tax increment financing as a revenue stream grew faster than other local revenue streams. If I had a PowerPoint, and I'm glad I don't, <laughs> In 1999-2000, tax increment financing statewide basis is $1.9 billion. So adult dollars, even in those years. By 2009 10 it's $5.4 billion. So rapidly growing source. And redevelopment agencies divert increasing shares of property taxes away from other cities, counties, and local governments. On a statewide basis, redevelopment tax increment was about 4% of all property tax collections in 82-83. And by 09-10, it's 12%. So they become big players in, in, the, in the fiscal arena. From the late 1940s, when we first began experimenting with redevelopment, to the 1970s, there was only slow growth in the number of redevelopment agencies, their project areas, and the size of their project areas. Something changes in the 70s, and there are two driving forces here. First of all, the California Supreme Court comes down with its Serrano decisions, which wonderfully, and I, I, the legislature, the people I used to work for, I think deserve a lot of credit for equalizing school funding in California. That is a massive social goal that's terrifically important. But combined with Proposition 13 in 1978, where the allocation of property tax revenue becomes a zero-sum game, taken together, that links the substantive concern of redevelopment and the fiscal concerns, and essentially state money is being used to fuel the growth of property tax increment financing in California. As the state backfills school districts because of the Serrano decisions and the implementing statutes, the state then ends up shouldering a bigger and bigger burden of school financing. And for those school districts overlapped with redevelopment agencies, the state general fund pays for it. So the seeds are planted by Serrano in 1971. We begin, still the retired we, <laughs> begin to understand that they, redevelopment, are using our money. And so in 1976, the legislature, very well-intentioned, sets up the mandatory 20% set aside for low and moderate income housing. We begin to carry out statewide policy goals through redevelopment agencies because they're diverting revenues. AB8, our revenue allocation system, allocates that money out and the state bails out local agencies. Our attempts at reform, don't work. 1983 for fiscal review committees, those failed to protect the state's interests. And then in the early 90s, the ERAF shifts begin to move money permanently away from cities, counties, and special districts, divert that money back to schools, and one of the perverse consequences is the state general fund picks up more and more of that school share. 
Those are permanent shifts, and they're episodic shifts for redevelopment agencies. 93, we get mandatory pass-through payments. Proposition 1A, one of the items that, that uh, Tracy had uh, up on the legislative analyst slide, Proposition 1A in 04 then locks in the revenue allocation for cities, counties, and districts, not for redevelopment agencies. And as predicted, the legislature came back and screwed redevelopment agencies with a device called SERAF. And so over nine times the legislature, or in nine times over a 20-year period, the legislature keeps hammering at redevelopment agencies. That leads us to Proposition 22 in 2010, which then locks in revenues for redevelopment agencies. This almost inexorable fiscal conflict then leads to Governor Brown's call in January of 11 to dissolve redevelopment agencies. And it reminds me a lot of the call and response that you get in American lyrics, right? <laughs> the result, as documented by the legislative analyst, is what we came to call the Mardi Gras effect. Now, those of us who were raised in Holy Mother Roman Catholic Church know that on Ash Wednesday, we have a period of fasting and abstinence ahead of us, but until then we get to party our brains out, right? <laughs> Right? And so that's the Mardi Gras effect. And that's exactly the way that local officials respond to the Jerry Brown call for this fasting and abstinence on property tax increment financing. Redevelopment agencies in the first six months of 2011 issue $1.5 billion worth of bonds. That compares to only $1.3 billion in the prior calendar year. So they do more in the first six months than they did in the prior year during the deepest recession since my parents' generation. Redevelopment agencies end up paying higher borrowing costs on those debts. Two-thirds of those issuances pay over 7% interest, a measure of risk, whereas prior to that time, only a quarter of them were paying rates that high. Redevelopment agencies then rush to transfer their assets and engage in any number of, of collaborative games. The search for alternatives to Jerry Brown's proposal fails to get any traction. The 10 big city mayors, led by Long Beach Mayor Bob Foster, a wonderful political operative, is ignored by both legislative leaders and by the leadership of the California Redevelopment Association. Practitioners within redevelopment land come up with a whole bunch of schemes to avoid this calamity. That gets no traction with either the leadership of the redevelopment industry or the legislature. Individual cities try and protect their favorite little programs. And interestingly enough to me as a former legislative staffer, most of that was championed by individual Republican <laughs> legislators who ostensibly hate redevelopment except when it's in your own city. And legislative staffers who drafted the implementing legislation, myself included, I'm here to confess that, we were politically isolated. We received no help from the redevelopment experts, and so the drafting is done unilaterally. And we end up doing best guessing about the possible consequences. And you know we guessed wrong. This means that legislators failed to recognize the deep hostility that local officials had towards that 20-year history of fiscal stress. Legislators, even those who were local elected officials, failed to understand the long-term effects of ERAF and of the constitutional limits that local officials faced. Legislators failed to sufficiently curb redevelopment abuses so in the public's mind there was eroding support despite the reforms of 1983, 1993, and 2006. And legislators failed to replace this emphasis on blight with a legitimate tax increment financing system. On the other side, the intransigence of the redevelopment industry had, I think, generational and cultural roots. So the leadership of the California Redevelopment Association had their attitudes shaped by this 20-year history of fiscal stress and battles with the legislature, this cat and mouse game 
over fiscal limits and, and policy consequences. The younger practitioners knew that redevelopment could be a force for good and that if redevelopment reforms didn't exist, then their clients would suffer as a result of state budget cuts, which Tracy described. In other words, then, there was a mutual strategic failure with colossal consequences. Never in my career did I see an entire segment of local government disappear, but that's what's happened. As the court said, what the legislature has enacted, it may repeal. So the subtitle, Max, you gave us is How Bad Is It? It's so bad, it's so bad politically that the lack of trust resulted in a very sad fiscal end for what should have been and maybe in the future could be a legitimate use of tax increment. Thanks. So, um, we have five minutes? That's it? Okay. With that concludes our panel. I thought we stayed kind of close to our time limit, but we have five minutes for some q and A. I'm sorry. Uh, is there a disagreement? Oh, okay. Oh, well. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tracy has three other slides. She really wants to. <laughs> I, I thought we had more time. So, uh, excellent. So uh, we do have, as planned, uh, time for Q&A. Uh, we have microphones that um, hopefully we have genuine questions uh, rather than we already had our presentations. No more presentations. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's open it up to the audience. Great panel. Thank you and, very and, much. And please identify yourself. If Do I, ha I have to? <laughs> no, okay. you don't. Uh, my name is Jim Gibbs. I'm a retired uh, public finance investment banker. And, and now I'm consulting, which means being underemployed. Um, <laughs> Uh, very curious about uh, staffing uh, in local state and local government. Uh, a lot of cities have, you know, very visibly cut staffing levels. At the state level, what portion of the state budget is state employee compensation, and has the legislature and government actually cut that portion of the budget? Do you want me to yeah, I'll, I'll start with kind of a, at the aggregate level. One thing that is very interesting, there have been 650,000 plus jobs in the state and local sector lost as a result of cuts at the state and local level. About half a million of those are local employees and then the rest are, are state. But it's interesting, you know, the labor costs are obviously a huge part of state budgets and so a huge percentage, particularly of certain departments. But employee compensation is not a huge percentage, and it's probably a, a one percentish, uh, depending on how you would define it. But here's where we are right now. With all the slides that I showed you about how tight resources are, we're really at a point where everything at the margin makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So what we're hearing from budget people in decision making is, a, a few million dollars extra can really make a problem for them as, as to trying to balance the budget. Part of it is because so much of spending is either on autopilot or not necessarily on autopilot, but folks politically don't want to change that. Can I say something about that? So um, I was just trying to find the numbers, but I have old data here that in 2007, California actually had the third lowest ratio of state employees oh, to right. population. And that's partly because a lot of things get done at the local level in California. There's a lot of decentralization. But also, it's a trade-off. We do pay employees more in California than other states. And part of that is because it's expensive to live here. 
But I did some work when I was at PPIC, and so this data is kind of old, um, and it varies a lot by functional area within the state, but there are some areas where the state pays more than private sector employers do for comparable employees, which you would think would also reflect the cost of living, that you have to pay someone additionally to live in this state. So there are some areas where we've made a policy choice to pay people more, and we could be getting higher quality employees in those areas as a result, but the trade-off is that we can afford fewer of them. So that's one of those decisions that I hope people will sort of engage on in the future. The, the California Budget Project has a piece I, that I believe is called uh, Professors and Prison Guards. And, and that, uh, I think, in a nutshell, uh, helps to answer your question. That's really where the state workforce is. Uh, over 70 percent, roughly 70 percent, of the state's general fund is actually going to local assistance. And by that, I don't mean cities. Very little of it comes to cities. It goes primarily to counties for health and welfare programs and to schools, local schools. What's remaining then is higher education and the cor uh, correction system. And even in those areas, we're seeing changes. In the correction system, uh, this la uh, two years ago, we, we embarked on this new realignment program uh, beginning in 2011, which will uh, shift many nonviolent offenders down into county jail systems. And, and, and there's also uh, th there's a commensurate reduction in the, in the state prison's budget as a result of that. Scott. I, I just wanted to clarify something because I, I slightly misspoke. I, when I sit around 1%, and it might be higher, I meant actual annual operating benefits costs. Obviously, compensation costs are a huge percent of the state budget because so, so much of most agencies and departments are just compensation and labor costs. You and then we'll get the next question behind you. Hi, uh, Terry Good. I'm with the Wells uh, Capital Management. I'm a portfolio manager. I manage a Cal fund. Um, my question is, um, what role should bondholders <coughs> play? Um, and this is probably more to Michael, because the local governments are, are pretty stressed. And there's been talk about bondholders sharing the pain. And debt costs, with debt costs being such a small percentage of the budget, <coughs> In most cases, what role do you think bondholders should play? Well, we're really talking about those few cities that are going to be at the point of having to restructure their debt. And really, you are. And, and I, I think it's important not to overemphasize this. And as I tried to end my, conclude my remarks with, uh, we should not be making widespread characterizations of default going on and widespread among localities. So we need to be surgical and look at those agencies that are looking at this. Um, the, the, the suggestion's also been made, I think recklessly, that the state of California could have come in and helped to solve all of this with some sort of assistance. And that too, when you look at my, my description, if you believe what I'm saying, that these, this was largely driven by economic circumstances, by policy decisions, by <coughs> locally elected officials, about compensation levels, about uh, going into economic development strategies. Those, those fundamentals are not something that the state of California is going to wade in and alter in any way. Um, so I, 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 think, um, I, I think the answer to your question comes, uh, and I'm going to, this is going to sound like a dodge, but it has to be at the local level. Everybody's got to share the pain. Um, and, and I think that's what you are seeing in a, in a workout like this. Everybody's got to come to the table. I'm going to lean in on that and, and follow up because um, my general perception is that those three cities uh, are not at the tip of the iceberg because there is no iceberg. Um, I, I have an anecdotal sense that we are not facing lots of multiple defaults. Having said that, one thing I would like these experts to tell me, or, or the audience to tell me, does California have an effective diagnostic tool that would allow us to look at cities and determine with some reasonable certainty which ones may be drifting towards icebergs and which ones are just in shallow water? The answer is no. Okay. But we do have that for, for schools. And the state has that for schools because the state has this Serrano relationship with schools. We have bailed school districts out. We will continue to bail school districts out. We have informally bailed out a couple of rural counties. Uh, but I think Michael is absolutely right. There is no political reason to bail out cities. 
because we don't share a fiscal relationship with them. Why don't we have such a fiscal analytical tool? Don't get me started. <laughs> okay. Do we need I one? Only I mean, you, you, you guys are in the bond business. Wouldn't you love to have some sort of diagnostic tool that wasn't proprietary? You know, you're going to have one inside. Well, well, the control is trying to do that right now. But I guess my point is, I have to buy California bonds. I'm a California yeah. portfolio manager. Yeah. But we have national funds as well. There's certain states that are viewed as non-bondholder friendly. Mm -hmm. Alabama is one. Mm -hmm. California is being kind of grouped in that. And so what's going to happen is the local government's cost of capital are it's going to go up. Right, as the ratings go down. Debt, yeah, yeah. Right? When we're buying this debt and it's you know secured by the general fund and that pledge is made, and then at the end, you know, this AB 506 process, which has no teeth, yep. You know, it speeds everyone to bankruptcy. See, I, no, I, I totally disagree with, with that at all. And okay. you're going to hear more about this today, but um, we'll, we'll talk about that for. But, but anyway, I but, find And I also think that this, this notion that there should be a widespread condemnation of the creditworthiness of California bonds is lazy. It's lazy. If you're in the business of wanting to play, play strategic investments and look at who's creditworthy, then you ought to be doing the scholarly research to figure it out. And that goes beyond making broad-based generalizations. Most California agencies are doing just fine, and they're going to be—they're going to pay their debts. And it's—it's it's not because they're not facing fiscal stress. Mm -hmm. Fiscal stress is widespread, mm -hmm. but most are managing it, mm -hmm. and and some are in particularly difficult situations in the Central Valley, or because they've done uh, over generous labor compensations, or both. But most of those, perhaps many of those, will manage their way out of it because they have uh, workable. Uh, uh, political environments to make that happen. So I think you have to be much more strategic and surgical about this. And some kind of broad-based uh, legislation is not going to help. Now, the, those fiscal measures, we do need to do a better job of that. There has been research done on this. Uh, I've got the same questions coming from city uh, leaders and city officials saying, I want to know, uh, I have some better measures to ask my city manager to bring me that, the details of how we compare so I can at least ask the strategic questions. As I've said, some of this stuff is not measurable, but at least will help us ans ask the, the, the appropriate questions and, and help to narrow the focus on where we should be concerned. Uh, Liz, back there. Hi, my name is uh, Marion Wolf, and I'm a principal of Vernaza Wolf Associates. And I want to, I think Michael made this comment, but if I'm not correct, please correct me. It was saying that Prop 98 is not the big problem we all think it is because it's just a question of a legislative override and somehow it would be okay. And I just don't see this as someone who's been watching public finance for decades. And I would like that explained. The other thing is that that graphic, uh, again, I don't know if it was Michael, uh, that showed we have fiscal problems in states that don't have a Prop 98 atmosphere, that's very um, sort of uh, simplistic in terms of wanting to know more details about each state's uh, fiscal situation. So that was me, I think. Um, so I don't, I don't want to get into the test one, test two, test three with Prop 98. It's a very complicated um, initiative. On the other hand, I think that there is some flexibility, um, and the legislature has used that flexibility to basically owe money. So I think someone mentioned, Scott mentioned, you know, states typically don't borrow to cover their operating costs. Um, except when they do, like California did with the uh, uh, economic recovery bonds in 2004. Yeah, that's okay. That's right. Okay. So, um, so, uh, but there are these hidden liabilities, like owing money to school districts under Prop 98. So I don't want to say that it's not an incredibly convoluted system, but there is some flexibility built into it. Uh, it obligates the state to spend a certain amount on K-12 education, but what would happen in the absence of Prop 98? Do you really think that the state would not spend on the most popular area of the budget? So I think what it, what it has done is it's been more of a, um, uh, a, 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 a ceiling rather than a floor. I think it's been more of a coordinating device for people to think about how much they want to spend on K-12 education. Um, in terms of the initiative process and spending, this is something where I know people at IGS have been talking about this for eons, and we'll probably get into it throughout the day. But personally, um, I just I look at a lot of states with budget troubles, and a lot of them don't have direct democracy. 
So, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that direct democracy is not something that uh, is, is an issue in California. Like I said, there's the threat value of the initiative process. Um, but I don't think that you can call it, you know, the um, bete noir that's caused all of these problems. So. Ned? Ned Hill, I'm, I'm a foreigner. I'm, I'm from Ohio, so this has been really fascinating <laughs> to me. Um, so it's like, like speaking in tongues and um, also... <laughs> And lot, handling snakes. It, well, dealing with snakes, that, that's where, that works. So that, now I'm back in Appalachia, so I feel okay. Um, the issue that I'm amazed with listening to this, if North Carolina could deal back in the Great Depression with putting in a state system of certifying city accounts and mm -hmm. going through before a, a and, and dealing with cities before they hit issues of insolvency, why can't California do it? If you're relying on the bond brokers to do it, you're gonna end up either with an overly risk averse system or a system that doesn't understand the intricacies of um, contingent liabilities because an awful lot of what you're talking about is a contingent liability problem that lays off the, the municipal books. So, and if you have a problem with direct democracy, well, it, you don't have a problem with direct democracy, you have the problem with the outcomes of some of, of direct democracy that's based on the fact that people don't understand the world of contingent liabilities and municipal finance. So it seems to me that just ruling out the role of a nonpartisan review board that goes and certifies financial statements of cities is uh, performing amputation way before you have to. I mean, other states have done this. The Great Depression was a stimulus that people took and responded to. If you, it, I, I, I'm sorry, California. If you guys blow this crisis, you deserve everything that's going to happen after it. Yeah. All right. So, to my preaching's done with. I'm back with snakes in Appalachia. Um, does anyone on the panel have anything to say about uh, the controller's efforts to try to take on a quasi phantom-like municipal local government oversight, particularly in in the wake of the Bell Vernon uh, fiasco? Uh, I think the controller can play a helpful role, but uh, the controller is one part of that helpful role. Uh, we can look at uh, the situation that's unfolded at this point in Bell. I mean, I'm talking about the whole story post corruption. Uh, in Cudahy, still a story to be told. In Southgate, uh, names you may not know. But places where I can, we can really look back at those particular case studies and see success. You look back at what's happening in Bell now, the reformers are in, they've got very professional management. And what happened there is the community finally woke up, the crisis happened, uh, they, 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 uh, they changed the politics, they got some new folks in there, and the profession stepped up. The profession stepped up. It's very important to uh, the profession of city management, the profession of city finance directors, uh, of, of professionals in local government, that, that the quality of their management and its reputation be maintained. So they stepped up, and you had top level, very well regarded, high integrity managers stepping in, pro bono in many cases, to step in and help with those situations. That's what's really gonna turn those kinds of situations around. Um, and even in these situations, we see like Stockton and Vallejo, and it took that kind of sea change in leadership, and, and, and sometimes it takes a sea change in the stakeholder leadership as well that finally make things happen. I'm talking about in the labor groups. Uh, sometimes that, that, that needs a change as well. So. Can, I, can I say something about that? Because I was surprised to hear in your presentation about the charter amendments that you thought had found the hands of managers. And I remember in the cases of those high-profile high corruption cases, there were also charter amendments that had sort of insulated leaders from, uh, that allowed them to compensate themselves very generously. Mm -hmm. And so I think people often talk about the state constitution as being unchangeable or these charters as being fixed constitutions, but these are policy choices. And I think the problem is that people are not paying attention. So if people are engaged, then they can change their constitutions, they can change their charters. That's a very important point. Dan Bornstein with the Country Cost of Times. Uh, do you guys consider, and I'd particularly be curious in Michael's take on this, uh, do you guys consider all bond debt the same, or do you think about the difference between capital debt and, say, pension debt, the intergenerational and the 
policy implications of it, and moreover, do you think the profession, as you discussed it, recognizes the difference or cares about it? Uh, no, they're not the same. Uh, they're, they, they're certainly are very important legal and policy nuances that have to be treated differently. Um, and, and this is why, uh, you know, even within the pension system, the obligations we have there, the pension and medical retiree health care, I mean, there are different kinds of vesting rights and obligations there, and they have to be treated differently. We've made major progress, I think, now in pension reform. You're going to hear more about that today. Um, and I think there's more progress to be made, but that's largely because it's, there are different characters of those, those uh, uh, ongoing liabilities. Can I say also, that because this gets back to paying attention, that um, I think economically there's a big difference, right? So when you borrow to build a facility, it makes sense to spread the costs of that borrowing over time because future taxpayers are going to be benefiting from that facility. When you borrow to pay your employees, that doesn't necessarily make sense. I'm so sorry. I don't know why this is happening. Um, but, um, but future taxpayers are not benefiting from those services, presumably, right? I mean, you could say that perhaps certain kinds of investments in human capital, like teaching, future taxpayers benefit from those from having a more educated workforce. But it's hard to convince someone to come into a city and assume the liabilities for uh, services that were consumed generations ago. And that's a real problem. Um, and I think this gets back to paying attention because um, Peter and I were sort of conferring about the um, pension giveaways in, at the state level in the late 1990s. I think people, again, just were not paying attention. And now that, until recently, that was tying the hands of state legislators until they basically reformed the pension system. But it's not appropriate to borrow for, uh, for uh, compensation costs, whereas it is appropriate to borrow for capital costs. Um, John Filan with uh, uh, DSI Civic Development Specialist. A lot of discussion has uh, occurred, I think appropriately, about um, some well-intentioned programs that maybe were unaffordable or otherwise not appropriately financed. And uh, I think some of those choices can be undone, as, you, as you've indicated. But a couple of examples of the rate of growth of certain things, uh, healthcare costs obviously affect employee, retiree healthcare and Medicaid on the one hand, and let's just say pensions on the other, particularly of late. We haven't discussed much about, even if you make some changes there, uh, what about the adequacy of the revenue base? You know, Scott mentioned the extreme volatility in California's tax base at the local level. It varies a lot, I'm certain. But does there have to be finally a move to a consumption tax or somehow directly taxing the services industry in so many states that effectively uh, don't end up paying corporate income taxes or whatever the equivalent might be? And anyway, we haven't had a mention of that. I'm not advocating it should all be solved by revenues, but as part of the overall solution, is a tax base also part of the exacerbating problem? Part of the structural setting. Without question, and I, my view is, and obviously politically it's so difficult, but we're going to have to reevaluate the revenue systems, not only at the state level, but all levels of government at least over a long period of time, the next 10 to 20 years. We did a straight line analysis, partly for the, the fun of it, to kind of figure out, uh, and however you measure it, I forget the years, I think we did it over 10 years, it was something like uh, Medicaid costs will go up 46% and revenue only 30%. We, it's just unsustainable at the state level. We do not have sufficient revenues to cover the costs of just Medicaid and healthcare, let alone K through 12 corrections and so forth. And it, at some point, I think something's got to give. And again, the politics are so difficult. But I think at some point, uh, whatever it is, either we're going to live with smaller government and make some real severe cost containment decisions at a policy level, or we're going to have to really look and, and relook at whether you tax all services or most services, really expand that tax base. In California, the, the, the sales tax system is really severely needs to be looked at. It's, it's, uh, it's declining over time in, uh, compared to population and growth in the economy because it doesn't tax the service sector, and yet we have a very high rate. That needs some reform, and that's been discussed. Uh, that's a long-term issue, a contributor, but one small contributor to this whole thing. I think whenever we talk about these kinds of structural reforms and, and people get obsessed about volatility and, and manageability and all those kind of things, and, and those are uh, concerns, but the other piece of that is just instilling management tools. 
At the local level, you look at a revenue portfolio, and if you're doing it responsibly, you make sure you build in substantial reserves to try to build in cushions for the volatility that's inherent in your revenue system. You understand where those, the, what the tax base is and how volatile it is. Uh, some do that fairly well. Uh, uh, but you see varying levels of reserves, appropriately so, depending upon lots of factors, including volatility of the revenue stream. State of California has not been able to get that kind of discipline. No fault to the people there, but perhaps the system, there, there's no reserve, uh, and yet it has a very volatile system. That's part of the problem. Well, we've reached, uh, un, you know, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our panel in time, so thank you so much. Uh, very interesting. Thank you for your participation. Hope to see you.